we were investigating uh, the dynamics of a classical particle or a system of particles in contact with a heat bath. And <clears throat> let me just rewind the concepts that we established by recalling you that our starting point was actually a Hamiltonian in the form of a caldera legate model. of this form and then basically what we have what we have been doing was integrate out the bath degrees of freedom from the Hamilton's equation exploiting the linearity of these equations for the bath degrees of freedom and then reinsert these results into the equations of motion for the particle, eventually reinterpreting our modified Hamilton's equation for the system as a stochastic set of differential equations, therefore arriving to the Langevin equation. In this lecture, we want to do something more ambitious. We want to show how the same problem can be formulated quantum mechanically. So today we're going to open, we discuss about quant open quantum system. And more specifically, we want, we want to discuss how to address the problem of dynamics of open quantum system within the path integral formalism. And the idea would be to start from the very same model, the one that you see written here, but rather than keeping the discussion at the classical level and going straight into Hamilton's equation, we will quantize this operator and consider its uh, operator interpretation in Schrodinger equation, and then derive the density matrix for the system, and eventually showing that in the appropriate limit, the density matrix becomes diagonal and becomes the solution of the Fokker Planck equation. So, in other words, you recover the Langevin dynamics after having quantized the theory and eventually taking the classical limit at the end of all this journey. So, what is the purpose of doing all this? Well, on the one hand, it is to rederive Langevin equations, not by postulating Hamilton's equation, but simply directly from the Schrodinger equation, which is an interesting. Uh, correspondence uh, principle application, but most importantly is that in doing this journey we will learn about concepts such as uh, Kaddish contour, which are at the heart of a significant fraction of contemporary theoretical physics. I would say that both in non-relativistic and relativistic quantum field theory, uh, the problems of open quantum systems is being increasingly addressed, and is becoming increasingly central. Uh, for classical systems, I already mentioned why. For quantum systems, there are many reasons. Uh, one of them is that it's a way of addressing non-equilibrium dynamics in, in quantum mechanics, and while we understand a lot of now static properties of systems in quantum mechanics through ground states or whatever, the study of dynamics, and in particular open dynamics, is much more like cutting-edge research. There's much less known about that, so it's a very active line of research in pure science. But also from an applied science perspective, if you're building a quantum computer, for instance, one of the central problems is the noise you get from the environment, and how the noise is affecting your results. So having control of the effect of noise on quantum calculation is also a fundamental step towards uh, realistic scientific applications, uh, technological applications. Okay, so that's uh, so let's let's that's our goal. Let's let's be a little bit more specific 
in setting up the problem we have, we have this Hamiltonian, and what we are interested in, we are interested in, in the reduced density matrix for the system. So in other words, given an initial density matrix, well, so, so given the density matrix operator at time t, which we, uh, which we will be trying to calculate in a moment, then what we're really interested in, and that's where the open character of the dynamics sets in, is in the xy matrix element of the density matrix. Remember, the density matrix is an operator, so it has matrix element, after you trace out the path degrees of freedom. So, if you look at it down here, well, fine, you got, you don't need to see my face more than you already do. Okay. So, as you can see here, the density matrix operator enters here. This is the i and j index of a density matrix, bra and cat. And what you're doing when you're reducing your uh, control on the system on a subset of variable is that you're marginalizing with respect to all others. In the language of density metrics, this corresponds to trace over all the uncontrolled degrees of freedom. So our goal is really this row x, y, and t. And uh, this is, of course, the object, density matrix at time t, is the operator in Hilbert, in Heisenberger representation in this case, is the operator that really contains all of the information about the dynamics. And the idea is really to trace this dynamics starting from an initial condition. And the initial condition is, of course, the density matrix at time zero. And <clears throat> we will assume for this lectures that the density matrix at time zero can be written as follows. So what is this uh, expression telling me? I'm assuming that in initial condition, my particle is prepared at point x0. The quantum state of a particle is an eigenstate of position operator at point x0, which experimentally means I place my particle right there at the beginning of time. And I let the path around it thermalize. So this is the Hamiltonian. This is the Hamiltonian, and of course here I'm missing a bit here. Here I'm missing the position, x, which is linearly coupled to my system. So what I'm doing here, I'm, I'm preparing the particle there, letting the harmonic oscillator thermalize, and then start the clock. And then see what happens. Measuring what is the probability well, in general, measuring the density matrix elements of x, y at time t. And of course, if I reduce to the diagonal elements of this density matrix, so let me write it here. Well, the diagonal magnitude is the probability finding particle at x at t. I want to emphasize that, in general, whenever you have incomplete knowledge on your system, whenever you have decoherence, then in general, you cannot address this probability problem using wave functions. So in open system, where you don't have complete control, 
you don't have complete coherence. Obvious system, you cannot write a density matrix in any basis as a sum of a as a sum of a single wave function. You have to include several wave functions. You can never turn a density matrix at any time in the form like this. So in other words, in open system, now let's see if I remember street signs. This is you can't use. So using street signs in open system, you can't use wave functions. So you're left with the only option of using the Schrodinger, the, the density matrix. So, okay. So let's, um, let's, let's move on and do this calculation. It's a bit of a tricky calculation, uh, but it basically generalizes the idea that we've been discussing so far in terms of path integrals. So, so what we want to do is rho x, y, t, condition from x naught, x naught, 0, or t naught if you want. And whenever I don't explicitly report a time label, uh, that means that I'm not actually, I'm setting t naught equal to 0. And this is equal to, once again, sum over alpha, integral of a dq alpha, x q alpha e to the negative i over h bar now let me remind you that the time evolution of an operator according to the Heisenberg equations of motions basically contains two evolution operator one on the left on the matrix and one on the right of the matrix Right? So that's that's the big that's the big difference because if you were writing the wave function at x t then you would have to write the evolution operator acting on the wave function at t naught. Now, when you want to build a path integral representation of this object here, then you have to apply the same ideas that you would have to apply for, uh, for classical for, for for closed systems. You have to apply trotter decomposition. to here and to here. But now, you see, I have a major difference. There are two times. One time of evolution operator that goes forward in time, and one time evolution operator that goes backward in time. Right? So let's be a little bit more specific for the time being, just for, for the sake of uh, of uh, making calculations simpler. Let's for a moment look at the diagonal element directly. The coherences the non of the diagonal element are also carrying interest information about entanglement, but let's not look at that in this particular case. Calculation will be slightly simpler this way. So basically what's going on is that your time is actually going from so basically what you're doing you have your x naught x naught so if I if I write if I write this more explicitly I get sum over alpha integral over dq alpha then I will get x q alpha e to the negative i h t x naught 
due to the beta at a path that depends on x naught, x naught e to the positive ih t x q alpha. So you see, I have one forward, one backward propagator, and they are all sort of connected. Because the Q's variables, if there was no Q variable, if there was no bath, then, then there would be no such an object here, obviously. And then I would have that my probability is just the square modulus of the propagator. Right? Because this would be, this term here would be the complex conjugate of this term here. And there would be no such a term here, in the absence of bath. So in the essence of bath, the probability of finding a particle at x is in fact the is in fact the um, the product of square modules of propagators, and we know that in the presence of bath, all this term now are actually coupled together, and maybe I should sort of say that here that's x naught, here is q, I guess, yeah, I should put x naught here, so that q alpha is actually even here. I can stick, okay, let's do it this way to be, to be sure that we're saying the right thing. And then if you want, here you can stick a, a resolution of the identity in the bath if you want to single out this term here. Remember, resolution of the identity would be something like... Okay. So all I'm trying to say is that the presence of the bath is coupling all this propagator in a non-trivial way so that the, the probability of finding the particle in a given point is no longer simply the product of the complex conjugate, the modulo square of a Feynman propagator. However, you can still apply trotter decomposition to each of these operators here, right? But then you see what happens is that you start from x naught. And you get a sort of a interesting connections of terms because uh, basically what's going on in here, you get first an evolution time up to a time t, then you have an evolution back, and then you have an evolution into the imaginary time. This is the complex plane. Let's let's draw it again. So as a result of a structure of uh, propagators, the density matrix is related to a path integral in which time is defined on a complex plane. You have a forward sector which comes from the presence of a terms like e over h by h t. You have a backward sector that comes from the presence of an infinite as of h bar h t. And then you have an imaginary time sector which comes from the presence of e to the advantage h. Now, bath. If you carefully, you know, define all the pieces and beats and put resolution of the identity here, you'll discover that basically your path integral can be written in the following form.
and let me be specific and set y to x again that would be well we can do this okay let's let's actually do this all the way otherwise it would be difficult to understand once again okay but let's see um Mm, 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 mm. I was trying to figure out yeah so let's let's do this in the same notation that is in the notes okay so we have in sum over all the harmonic oscillator integrals over first path of x q alpha e to the negative i h over h bar t then I have x naught but now see what I want to do now is to uh, prepare the ground for doing Trotter decomposition also for the imaginary part. So let me add here a resolution of the identity. Let me call, me, let me call it, um, for instance, dq. Q. So I will get another integral here over dq, and I will make q x naught. So by doing this, I've done nothing here put one. Then I have my bath Hamiltonian and then remember I'm left with my Q alpha here and, and now I want uh, to to add um, an additional identity here to disentangle these two and so let me call it for instance so let's following up on the notation uh, QI let's call it QE and uh, I think uh, yes I don't need to put well formally here I could put and also a term depending on another variable for the system X but since this Hamiltonian is diagonal in X on this side there is there would be simply a Delta function removing this extra variable in X and setting equal to x naught, so there is no point to add and subtract uh, um, an integral over the initial system's positions because, and then say, well, the initial system position is actually staking, it's just fixed at x naught, so let me not do that. And slightly, info, slightly improperly, I'm using two different type of vectors here and here. They belong to different Hilbert spaces, but you got a point. Okay, so here I get another QE on that. Okay, and I think here I can put X naught essentially because of what I said. So this is the propagator that goes from X naught to X forward in time from x0 to x, so here is x0, here is x in, in position, here is q, here is small qa, this is big qa, 
so this is called alpha prime, and of course there's a summation of an alpha prime here. So this is capital Q alpha prime, and this is Q alpha. Then I have a propagator from Q alpha prime to QE in imaginary time for an extent minus beta along the imaginary axis. But x naught is remaining the same here and here. And then I have a propagator from x to q, but backwards in time. So I have something like this. This weird con time contour is called the Keldish Schwinger. time contour or formalism sometimes. Now all we are left to be doing is to apply the standard Trotter decomposition for each of these propagator, two in real time and one in imaginary time. And I now I won't do that because we know how to do that from lecture whatever one of this course online and lecture four from the entire course before the course went online. So if you go back on the notes, you see how to evaluate each of these propagators, and I'll just pump in the final result. The final result would be the equation that I was attempting to write before, before I realized that it was a little bit too much for us for you to... Now, to follow. I'm using a slightly different notation now because I'm using the notation that is on the on the um, on the notes. But I think if you do things carefully, you'll be able to to recover all this index, a lot of path integrals. really a lot of them, but then after I'm done writing, we comment that that's exactly what we expect. So let me just write things. Okay, so that's a very complicated expression, but now if we look at them, we understand the structure of it. First of all, this term here, these are plain normal integrals that come from having inserted resolution of the identity between operators. So now if you, if you go back there to my previous slides, you'll discover that I put several uh, bath positions. So one of them was inserted here just for the trace for marginalized over non-controlled variables in the definition of the density matrix, while these two were introduced uh, to stick the resolution of the identity between operators. Now, if I draw the Keldish contour, let me remind you that this part is the thermal part. 
is the it comes from taking this the Hamiltonian for the bath and remember the Hamiltonian for the bath at the beginning is taken in equilibrium with a particle at a given position so here x is fixed at position x0 it is just a parameter so the path integral in imaginary time is only over the bath variables because the particle is not exploring Boltzmann distribution it's just sticking a point and then I have four other path integrals I've denoted with x prime and q prime the bath and system the system and bath variables associated with the former forward time evolution operator decomposition and I'm writing x double prime q double prime for the degrees of freedom belonging to the trotter decomposition of the backward propagator now, if you look at that, then you immediately understand what, why the structure of these actions are what they are. Because in the first line, I see I have the action. This, the first term is the Schrodinger action. And by Schrodinger action, I just mean mean the Schrodinger action is simply the one that comes in the normal path integral that we discussed, the final path integral. Right? So this term is simply telling me when I'm when I'm prop when I'm Trotterizing the, the, the forward uh, propagator, I get a, a standard term for the part of the Hamiltonian that is simply, this is the part that comes from the part of the Hamiltonian that is simply p squared over 2m plus u of x, right? So the part that would be there even if the, part, if the bath wasn't there. And this part is the result system bath is the result of the contribution to the to the to the trotter decomposition coming from the part of the Hamiltonian which we called HBS, which is basically the caldera laget part of the Hamiltonian coupled with my particle linearly. Now, downstairs, meaning here, we get exactly the same contributions. But for the lower part of the Kaddish contour, as a result of which I get a negative sign here. And of course, these two are summed. So we get exactly the same structure of the negative sign that comes from the fact that time goes travels back in time in this contour. And finally, this is the Euclidean action. And it's only containing a path integration. And sorry, there's a mistake here. This is over QE. And it's the path that moves along the imaginary time. Because this is the part that parameterizing the e to the negative beta h system bath. So the fact they have a particle fixed at x0 and the bath is thermalizing around it. And from one of the first lectures, I guess the second lecture is online, we see that you can relate quantum partition functions to imaginary time path integrals. So in this expression, there's much of what we did in the first few lectures, and then we manipulate this equation and arrive to what we did in the last lectures, rewriting all this in terms of a solution of a Fokker-Planck equation if my particle is classical. So you see that Fokker-Planck dynamics is contained in the, as a classical limit of um, quantum dynamics. Okay, obviously this path integral here is nice to write and it's completely useless, right? I mean in terms of, uh, I mean it's five path integrals, 
for one particle in a bath. It's very, very complicated. But there is a way you can simplify it. And the way you can simplify it is because the path integral over the bath variables is a path integral of a harmonic oscillator which means that it is a path integral of a Gaussian functional because the harmonic oscillator is a quadratic kinetic energy and a quadratic potential energy so in the exponent you have at most quadratic terms now for technical reasons the second part of this course will be mostly devoted into computing path integrals for fields and and when you have uh, one of the first thing we're going to do is to prove a theorem which is in fact a big theorem uh, which in path integral formulation is basically teaching how to solve gaussian path integral uh, i could have done this lecture after we have done that so you would have completely understood the result of the next step in the derivation when i perform the gaussian integral on the other hand I would have lost logical consistency in favor of mathematical consistency. Mathematical consistency is, a, is what I mean by mathematical consistency is that you can understand the mathematical steps much more clearly because you have learned how to do Gaussian integrals. By logical consistency is that we looked at the open quantum systems, we looked at the quantum system at the classical level, now we're doing the same calculation at the quantum level using a tool that we will develop a little bit further on in the course. So, basically, the next step is I can do the integral over the Qs, all three of them together, because they are all Gaussian integral. How? Wait the end of the course to see how. So, the next step in the mathematical derivation at this stage of the course is something you can only take for granted, but by the time you're done with the course, you say, oh, of course, that's the result because you have seen enough Gaussian integrals at that point. So, after performing the integral over the Q variables, the resulting expression for the density matrix will be only a function of the path integral of the X variables, obviously because I've integrated out the Q variables. I will have two of them. I will have my Schrodinger. That's going to be unchanged, because the Schrodinger path of the action does not depend on the Qs, so it goes out of the integral, if you want. I will get the opposite Schrodinger action for the lower part of the branch of the path integral because that doesn't depend on Q again. But then the result of integrating over Q will give me some functions of X here, right? Because I've integrated and I get a function which depends parametrically on x prime, x second prime, because they were coupled to q prime and q double prime. And that was exactly what we were doing where we were expressing the solutions of a bath. Remember, in, these were the bath solutions when we were doing the classical calculations in omega space. They were function, parametric function of the x solution so that then I could use these solutions back into the equations of motion for the x and get a single equation of motion. So at this level, this is the quantum analog of the same step. So in the literature, the missing term here is written in the following way. It's called E. to the negative f 
and this is called the influence functional because this functional contains the information how the bath influences the motion of the particle. Now, the next line is once again the line which I will not be able to convince you about before we solve Gaussian integral with path integrals. So this is the part you have to believe me for now. For a couple of, maybe for four or five lectures. Okay, Depending on how fast they go online, I have no idea. So it contains two times, so it's non-local in time, and it contains x t prime, x double prime, t prime, dot, dot, times a two function that depends on two variables, time its complex conjugate, times a term, which I write this way, and this is the definition this is the, there's a missing sum here okay now this is a super complicated expression of course you don't have to copy it down from the screen you find it on the web in the notes already type, type it in and I don't expect you to remember of course there is a term here that depends on B and B is the Green's function of the harmonic oscillator once again and so B T is actually given by this And you should recognize that it looks very much similar to the one we found in classical mechanics, but now there are eyes coming out. Now, I don't want I won't be able to give you the proof of this at this level, but I can at least motivate why do we get the two-point function after integrating the Gaussian integral. So for those of you who have taken QED advanced quantum theory, or at least I've seen the QED Lagrangian. The QED Lagrangian is structurally extremely similar to this Lagrangian. Why? Because I have a quadratic term for the electron, a quadratic term for the photon, right? If you, if you spell this out, in terms of photons, then clearly this is quadratic. But then in addition, so let me do this. And then in addition, I have a linear coupling between photon and electrons. Right? In our case, we have a system with a quadrat with his own whatever potential, maybe no quadratic, which plays the role of this part. We have a bath, which is quadratic, and we have a linear coupling between my system and bath. Okay? Now if what happens in QED 
if you integrate out the photon field. Instead of explicitly taking into account of photon exchange between an electron, say, and a positron, for instance, you replace this with a potential, right? And I'm being admittedly sloppy at this level. I'll be more quantitative in a couple of lectures when we will do statistical field theory and implicitly quantum field theory because the two formally are the same and we will manage with this integration. But at least in the static limit, this is the Coulomb potential. So what happens? At the Coulomb potential, in the static limit, the time, the zeroth component here becomes the delta function, and then you have a, a Coulomb potential for the spatial component. So basically, instead of having explicitly photons in the game, you replace the fact that you have photons with a nonlinear uh, function that typically is the Green's function of the theory you have integrated out. In fact, the Coulomb term is the Green's function of the Maxwell's equation, right? In the static limit. Now, in this case, we have uh, done exactly the same. We have a linear coupling to an harmonic theory, the Bath. We have integrated out the Bath, and the result is that we remove that, but instead of having the Coulomb term, we have the two-point function of the Bath term. That's nice, but it's still too complex. And now, what do we do with it? We do exactly what we did when we were doing the classical calculation. We assume decoupling between time scales of system and bath. And remember, what was that meaning is that the kernel function that entered the effective Langevin equation we derived after integrating out the bath was reduced to a delta function, assuming that you go to Fourier space and expand, remember? But now we do the same, but since we have a quantum theory, we, for, for reasons that are clear only a posteriori, we go one step further and say, okay, B of t is C1 delta t plus I C2 delta t of delta t, which corresponds to expanding the Fourier components to linear term, not to only to constant term. Now, at this level, C1 and C2 are two insofar unspecified constants. And as usual, when you do effective field theory, you put them there, and then a posteriori, you fit them either to experiment or you match them to reproduce a more microscopic calculation. In this case, the way you do to determine C1 and C2, you fit them to make sure that after you take in the classical limit, the resulting theory will be satisfying the right relationship for the classical theory, meaning fluctuation-dissipation relationships. So, the way I could proceed from this point on is to leave this C1 and C2 as a free variable, and then in the next step of the derivation, which comes in the next slide, I will derive a generalized Langevin equation. But this generalized Langevin equation will not satisfy the detailed balance condition, therefore will not be a viable physical theory, unless C1 and C2 are precisely related to the diffusion constant and the temperature in a particular way, which you can fix by imposing the correspondence between the Langevin equation you derive from quantum mechanics from the, with the Langevin equation we derive from the Hamiltonian mechanics. So in other words, from quantum mechanics and classical mechanics, we will arrive to the same Langevin equation. But in order to, to, to arrive to the same Langevin equation, C1 and C2 
must be fixed to be what I'm going to write now. So, from this quantum theory, taking the classical limit, you get the same Langevin equation you get starting from the Hamilton's equation, only if C1 and C2 are chosen to be the following. 2m gamma kt divided by h bar c2 m gamma. Okay, so if you do that, then you can go back to the expression of a path integral, and rather than having a non-local influence functional in time, by non-local in time it means that the influence functional contain memory effect, so it was a convolution of times, there were two times, tai 1 and tai 2, related by d of tai 1 minus tai 2. If you, if you, if you use this expression here, assume a decoupling, you have loss of memory, you have Markovian behavior, loss of memory, and as a result of which your double integral in time disappears into a single integral in time. Finally, we do one last change of variable, and we do something we redefine the position fields, position uh, variables. Remember, we have two systems position variables, one in the upper level contour and one in the down level contour. And we define the following. We change variable in the path integral. Clearly, the change of variable is linear. There's no Jacobian. Because this is this is reminiscent of taking the center of mass and the relative motion. Rather than relative motion for two particles, is the relative motion between the position at the same time above and below the Kaldish contour. So the average and the distance are the R and Ys. If you do that, then your path integral will depend only on r's and y's and not on x1 and x double prime, x prime and x double prime. The final expression for the path integral would be rho of x where r at t is equal to x because both x prime and x double prime are equal to x, the final position, so the average is again equal to x, x t, starting from x naught, x naught. This is going to be equal to a path integral over the r field, from x naught to x, the path integral over the y field. Now, both the initial and final position are the same, so the distance in the beginning and at the end are zero, that's at time t, this is at time zero, so this is from zero to zero. And then there are two terms here in the exponent, and let me write this as i over h bar, w of r and y plus phi prime of r and y, and now all I have to do is to tell you what this w and phi are. w of r and y is a time integral, as all functionals are, of um, r dot y dot minus r plus y half plus v of r minus y half and phi prime of r and y is equal to d time prime zero t i m gamma kt divided by h bar y square of tau plus plus m gamma r dot y of course all of this a function of time. And the function of time are here, here, and here, everywhere, of course. So, 
Now, I want to stress that up to this point, we made only one assumption. We only made the assumption that a classical bath is fast. The, 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 the harmonic, quantum harmonic oscillator in the bath are fast and decoupled. We are still fully quantum. And if we want to stay fully quantum, that's as much as you can go. However, now we see that with this change of variable, and this is the key, we notice that the, this field here behaves like almost a Gaussian up to this I term, which uh, sort of goes away because there is another one in the exponent. Remember, there's an I over H bar, and then there's this uh, phi prime. So basically, this I that sits inside phi prime kills, becomes a negative after you combine it with the other E. So this is really a Gaussian integral. And this Gaussian integral, you know, is sort of confining wise to small values because, you know, this if h bar goes to zero, or if h bar is very small, then terms that are far away from zero in y will be exponentially suppressed by this Gaussian term. So this provides the basis of a semi-classical approximation, actually of a classical approximation. So based on this, I can expand this function here and this function here to linear order in y, right? Because large fluctuations of y will be suppressed exponentially by this term. So because of this, I can write v of r plus y half, and there is a negative here. I'm combining the two terms that enter here, 1 and 2. And these two terms, let me write it this way, v of r plus y half negative plus v of r negative y half, this two terms would be, well, to zeroth order, they cancel out. I only have the first order correction. So this would be minus v prime y half, and this would be minus v prime y half. So this would be minus v prime y. So, guess what? after I have uh, taken the classical, the semi-classical limit, I'm assuming quantum mechanics is, is not a dry, h bar is a small scale, then all my integrals in y's becomes at most quadratic in y. And you can integrate it out. Why? Because, as again, it's a path integral over a function of a functional which contains only quadratic term at the exponent. So it's a Gaussian path integral. Once again, I don't, you don't know what is the Gaussian integral, how to solve, but if you do the calculation, then your den diagonal density matrix becomes let me call it the probability of finding the particle x at time t, provided it was at x naught, and it becomes integral over dr from x naught to x to negative b over 4m gamma double dot plus m gamma x dot plus gradient of u squared. Now, that's the result of doing the Gaussian integral that you don't know how to do but you will be able to do in a couple of lectures. And guess what? 
This is just a path integral representation of the Langevin dynamics. We are used to this part of the path integral because that's the one that survives after you've taken the overdumped limit, right? But, but if you don't take the overdone limit, the path integral formulation of the Langevin dynamics contains also the acceleration term, which is sitting right here. I mean, you don't need a proof to see that. It's complete. Well, actually, if you want to be rigorous, you do need a proof because we have to show that the Jacobian is, 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 it does not mess up, but fine. That's the, how the path integral formulation of Langevin equation goes. So this is really the Green's functions of the Fokker-Planck equation without the underdump, in the underdump regime. So what did we find? We started off from a fully quantum theory fully quantum, did a conceptually the same operation we did in deriving the Langevin equation, but remaining at the quantum level. And by doing this, we arrived to what you expect to find. The probability distribution is simply, since we made the same physical approximation with the only ad addition of a classical approximation, which was given for granted before, we arrived to the same results, that is the Fokker-Planck equation. Now, I should say something. This is not an easy class, not easy material. First of all, because it's tricky, it's uh, really recent. I think it has a, maybe 15 years. It's difficult, but also particularly difficult if you try to digest this material completely at this level of the course. So normally, when I give this course in person, I postpone this material at the end of the course when people have calculation skills. However, these lectures are recorded. So I figured maybe you, it's, it plays well for you to take this material, even if you cannot go through all the steps, now that it fits logically in the picture. And at the end of the course, after you learned how to do Gaussian pathetical, you can go back to this lecture and rewind it and look at it again, and everything will fit into place. I'm trying to interpret the opportunities, for good or for bad, that are given by e-learning, the fact that we are forced to record lectures. And this is not something I could be doing if I were doing this alive, in a, in a live classroom, because I cannot rewind my lecture. But, but since we are recording this anyway, and you can read one of the lectures, I think it pays. Uh, so what we proved today is we, we learned a little bit of a Keldish formalism, and we saw how path integrals are generalized to study open quantum systems, and I hope you understand how powerful they are, because the Langevin equation really comes out straight out of a quantum description. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.